Good morning, and welcome to the last lecture, at least from my end, this fall. I don't know if it's the same thing hold for you. Anyone having a lecture in the afternoon? <laughs> so today we are going to kind of close by combining some of the pieces that we've been kind of putting together so far, <coughs> ending in chapter 11. And then I will just come with a few things for a, an outlook for what is next after this. <coughs> if you want to do more, of course. So why do you want to do something recursive slash adaptive? We've done these things already to some extent. Well, I don't know if you remember these data from a long time ago. These are from the VEX heating network, where you can see in black the heating consumption, and in white the temperature on top. Well, of course, the temperature scale over here is adjusted so that downwards is positive, because then means downwards means less consumption. So this is basically a fit that was made. And you can see there is a clear relation there. But what is maybe not so clear is, is this relation always the same? Or does things change over time? So <coughs> things does change over time, but we also get more information over time. The thing about getting more information over time, I don't know if you recall, but we actually done that. Do you recall? Estimating new parameters whenever we get a new observation. When did we do that? We did it for the local linear model or glo uh, local trend model. Actually, also the global trend model you did there. Actually, you just updated. But you had a global model, you, but you re-estimated the slope and intercept if it was a linear model um, every time you got a new observation. Um, so that's basically where we're going back to today. Um, and you can say what we did there, as what we're going to do today, is rather than recalculating everything, we're going to adjust our previous estimates. And as we also discussed, models are approximations. And you want to find the model that gives you the best approximation to the data that you have. So that also kind of ties back to if we can do a more local model of some kind, it doesn't have to kind of reflect everything that is happening underneath, as long as it's, as it's reflecting and able to track the main patterns. That's actually th the most important things. And I mean, things does change over time. Just a slightly different case. Um, how many of you have worked work with wind turbines? One way or the other. A few, a little bit. And um, that is one odd thing about wind turbines. If there is a forest next to a wind turbine, of a, a park of uh, turbines, then you can actually see if there's leaves on the trees or not. Because the so-called roughness of the, a of the surrounding area changes. So the flow of air changes. And you can see that if the roughness of the area is less, then you get a higher power output because the air that you get is more laminar. It's not so much the case now that the, you had, I mean, much higher to uh, towers, but in the old days it was more of an issue. But that's also one of the reasons why you put them offshore, because when you have just water, you have very little roughness. <laughs> Whereas when you are in a city, you hardly ever see any wind turbines because you have all the buildings giving turbulence, taking out all the energy effectively from what you could produce. Um, so you will see that those systems, depending on what is in the surroundings, the parameter, the so-called power curve, will change over time with the season. But if you're just going to do predictions for the next day, it's not a problem that you have every I mean, in the fall, you lose the leaves, and then in the spring, they come back. You can trace that. You don't need to make a model that covers that. Th then you also have to kind of make a model that covers if someone changes the forest. The forest is growing higher every year, stuff like that. So there's a lot of cases where you can f 
think of it and say, well, I do not actually expect to get the same parameters over time. I do expect changes. Take financial systems. I mean, does anyone expect tomorrow to be like today? We may hope so, but we also know that there's a risk of something changing. And then the other thing is, when you're going to make software, well, which parameters should I use for setting this system up? Well, it's much nicer to produce something. If you don't have to do that, the system will just learn from the data that you give it. And you say, well, leave the box sitting there for a month, or use the last month of data that because you already collected that, and then you can just go. You don't have to update anything. This system will adjust to your system. That's what they're doing in the district heating network. There also the load profiles change over time. And the temperature dependence is not always linear. Um, it's a good approximation, but there are other things going on. So you want to make something that learns and adjusts. So these are some of the models that we have looked at earlier on in various settings that can be easily written as recursive least squares. Basically, the first model is just a, a, a pure regression model where you have some inputs here called Ys, a U, sorry. Um, and you can have, in this case, just M of those. We haven't spent much time on that model because it's not the one that is mostly related to time series uh, because we like to have, you can say, some kind of dependencies on signals. So we've done the finite impulse response where we have an input, but we have some weights on the different inputs. That, that's fine. We like that. We've spent a lot of time on autoaggressive models where you, you can say the output current is given as some weight of the previous outputs plus some noise. And of course, we can combine this AR part with some input signals and some process for the input signals as well. But if you look at these, all these models are characterized by the fact that everything that is on the right-hand side down here is known at time t, except for the parameters. So we can write all these models as a linear regression model. In the local trend model, we only looked at, you can say, the previous observations as predictors, uh, as only the previous, um, but we can do a lot of different structures. We did solve the autoregressive estimation of the parameters here using linear regression as well. So that is straightforward. And I've, it's also fairly straightforward to do this recursively. But you say, in, generically, what I just said is you can take all those models and write them as a standard linear regression model. You have, you can say, a mean value. Typically, you have some regressions on the previous outcome and on some inputs. It may be on different lags of the same input. It may be on different inputs, ba basically just some inputs. And I hope that you by now remember what is the solution. When I have this system, I wrote all my, you can say, predictors on matrix form. Then I what I want to minimize is this least squares problem. And I want to find the theta parameter value that gives me the minimum of my penalty function. Now, I think for the last time I'll ask what comes next. What is the solution to this? It's the standard least squares solution. I know it's the last day in the semester, <laughs> but I can see some eyes that are awake. <laughs> so what is it? Yes. It's the solution to the normal equation. Yes. So it is. I want some x's and y's and transposes and inverses and things. 
Do you call anyone? <laughs> You're blank? Yes? X transpose X, yes. And then this thing inverse, yes. Let's see. Yes. That would be cheating to just see the next slide. <laughs> but yes, X transpose X inverse, this gives you how much information do you have. And then this gives you the projection effectively um, from the Y's to the thetas. So th that's what we are always returning to. We have something here that only depends on the predictors. And then we have some way where we're saying, well, how is the relation to the observations? And for the trend model, we wrote this, for instance, as R inverse and then on H with some subscripts for time and stuff like that. But we'll get to that in a moment. But we have an R matrix that represents this, and we have H representing this. This is just writing it all up. And I remember having said this before. Basically, when you look at R, T here, well, it's X transpose X. And then that actually consists of the observations, the outer product of all the vectors of the observations, oh sorry, predictors up to time t, and then you make a sum of all those. That also means that when you get the next one, you just add one more element to that sum. So that's a fairly easy one to do the cursive. For the ht, which is x transpose y from here, well, you have the same that each element here is independent of the others as such. You can calculate them independently, and you just have to keep track of the sum. So you have these matrices for each time point, and these vectors here that you're just summing. And you can say all there is to do this recursively for the generic model. We've done it for a particular model so far. Now we're just doing it for a generic least squares regression model. Basically, this is a uh, uh, the same as we've seen before. You get to RT by taking RT minus 1 and add the nearest predictor. That's easy. HT is the previous HT plus xt on yt. Notice that here xt is just a vector, and it's a row vector but per default the way it's written up here. So, no, it's a column vector, sorry. It's a column vector, as always. Um, the one thing here that is different from the local trend model, I don't know if you recall that. Here is actually simpler in a sense. Because in the local trend model, we also here had to keep track of the fact that we were shifting time every time that we move forward. Here we use the same reference time. So in the local trend model, we have to pre-multiply something on H, which we don't have to do now. So here it's actually simpler for that perspective. But then you have to keep track of, you can say, time when you define X. So effectively, you're doing the same thing. You're just doing it at a different place. Um, OK, so that's what we are starting off with. And to initialize this, you just start with appropriate matrix of zeros for R0, and H should just be a vector of 0. And then, as we discussed sometimes, well, before actually getting an estimate out of this, as in before calculating theta hat t equals rt ht, well, you should make sure that rt is actually invertible. So 
if you're just doing an AR2 model, for instance, then you have the dimension of x here, well, depending on whether it's with or without a mean value. But let's see, let's just assume that there's no mean value. So what is then the dimension of my x vector if I have an AR2 model? How many predictors do you need in order to estimate, um, to predict with an AR2 model? I need two. So that's a dimension. So R is a two by two matrix. How many observations do I need before I can invert that? You need two. I mean, it's the same thing. You need two points before you can fit a straight line. The first one, you should make sure that they're not identical. Because then you're still left with I mean, one degree of freedom too many. So you need to just check that it's actually invertible. Typically, you won't do it based on the two. You will wait for some. That's, as I said previously, let it run for a month, just sitting there, and then start using it. Now, maybe I should just write these. Um, so we have that RT equals RT minus 1 plus XT, XT transpose. And HT is equal to HT minus 1 plus XT on YT. I just want to have that as reference because when you're doing this, you actually have three statements, right? But basically what you care about, you're not caring about these particular ones. You want, you like the RT because the inverse of that, as in inverse Hessian, gives you some information about how good are your estimates. But H here is just a helper. So you can actually rewrite the system just like this. So eliminating the H function. And the way the story goes is basically that you start from here, and then you say theta t equals, let me just say, repeat that over there, rt inverse ht. Now ht is given down there. So this here equals, ah, let me just write it down here, rt inverse on ht minus 1 plus xt yt. That's fair. Now, what should we do with ht minus 1? Well, if we take this and pre-multiply by R T, then you can see that this is the same as R T inverse, and then you get the R T minus one times theta hat T minus one. Basically, we want a recursion from T to hat minus uh, T minus one plus from before, xt on yt. OK. So what to do next? Now we have this rt minus 1 here. But we want it to be more simple. So what we'll do is to take this equation here, and then we'll say, well, rt minus 1, we have that there. Then we'll just move this to the left-hand side, and we are moving forward from there. So RT minus 1 is the same as RT minus XT, XT transpose. 
This here should be multiplied on theta t minus 1 hat. And then, of course, we should keep the xt yt like that. And now I can multiply this theta t in here. rt inverse. And then I get a rt on theta hat t minus 1. And then I get a minus xt xt transpose theta t minus 1 hat. And then I get the last term remains the same, xt yt. When I look at this, I want to multiply this rt inverse into the whole thing and collect some terms. If I'm lucky, I can just write it out here. So the r inverse was the r, both subscript t, did of course cancel out. So I get a theta hat t minus 1 first. And then the last two terms here, they both have a leading xt. So I will write it as a plus r t inverse and then xt, and then the parenthesis, and then I'll take the positive part first. What is left out here is yt minus, and what is left here is xt transpose and theta. Oop. Theta t, min t minus 1 hat, and I just made it in the corner. So now I have that. I get theta t hat by taking the previous estimate, and then I look at the yt minus xt on theta t hat uh, t minus 1, and then I pre-multiply with something. Is this similar to something you've seen before? I say, of course it is, because otherwise I wouldn't ask. So this here is a one-step prediction error. So you take a state of something, you get a new observation, and then you do an update where you say, well, it's what it was, plus something times the difference between what I predicted. Is this similar to something? if I use the term reconstruction instead. It's not so different from the state update in the common filter. It just says k there. I don't know if you recall, but now you know. <laughs> now, the next thing is, when doing these calculations, and if you want to do it fast and you want to do it robust, what you want to Avoid is this matrix inversion. Because inverting a matrix is something that can be numerically unstable. It's the one part, because everything else here is just multiplying and subtracting and adding, which numerically are rather robust. The big thing is, well, what if RT at some point is not that, um, you can see that it's still positive similarity, but it's close to not being it. So you cannot invert it. Um, th that's the question. So can you actually rewrite this whole thing? And basically, the answer is yes. It looks more complicated. Here I just defined the common, like common gain, um, just like before. So you have the same update here. So kt represents down here, xt inverse, oh sorry, rt inverse xt. But then we have this denominator down here. And, and why do I like to make life more complicated, at least looking more complicated? If you look at the dimension of the denominator here, 
What is that? It's quite easy to see. Yes? One, exactly. It's a scalar. Division by a scalar is a rather robust thing. So you won't run into any numerical problems. And if you go through all the different parts here, you can actually work out that the number of operations you have to do is less when you specify this in this way rather than in that way up there. Nowadays, it may not matter so much if your numerical performance is good enough. And if your data, if you have enough information always in your data, then your RT will contain enough information. But when we start to do this adaptively, as in with forgetting, as we did a long time ago as well, then I don't know if you remember, but sometimes we use lambdas that were fairly small. That also means that RT is not, long, no, not longer, <coughs> no longer behaving as nice as we would like it to be. So therefore, it may make sense to kind of formulate it in a different way where everything you get has a much nicer structure. So you get a, a vector up here <coughs> instead. So that's just to say that you can make life easier even though it looks more complicated. So if you go back to the heat consumption data here, these are the raw data as they are. Now, if I run that model true, what I'll get are those estimates here. I forgot one thing up here. What did I forget? If I had handed this, this in and you were grading me, where would you? Oof. Thank you. I did not put any measure uncertainty in here. <laughs> because for now, I just wanted to kind of illustrate what's going on. Um, so what happens is that basically you have an intercept estimation that goes to some stationary level, and the slope also goes to some stationary level in this case here. And I will actually just skip the uncertainty many times today. It's basically just going back to the weighted least square setup and, and taking a local trend model and taking it from there. Now, what I also kind of, what we did back then was to start forgetting. Forgetting the old observations because we want to adopt, not just to update our estimate, but we also want to make something that can adjust to the fact that life and the Earth and whatever is changing over time. So basically, we go back to the weighted least square setting like this. The solution is the same as for the unweighted, except that we insert a couple of weight matrices down here. And these weights, as given here as betas, we can write the W as a diagonal matrix of all those weights. The important thing is that we give the newest observation weight 1 just to have a reference somewhere. We could pick that to be anything, but th there are basically two things you can do. You can either say that one of them is 1 or the sum should be 1. Why doesn't it matter? in the particular case. When you have this expression here, why doesn't it matter if I scale with this with something so that wa the weights sum to 1? Typically, if you want to consider distributions or whatever, you like so like the weight. If it sums to 1, then you're just doing a weighted average, right? Why doesn't it matter here? That is one thing. We're scaling everything, but there's actually one more thing to it. I have it here, inverse, and here, not inverse. So if I just multiply by a scalar here and there, well, I multiply that inverse and the same scalar. Cancel out. So that's an important thing to notice 
in some of the calculations. Also, present the course haven't underlined it so much, but there are a lot of things where these weights actually, the norm, the, the, the value of actually is cancelling out. So, therefore, you have to, I mean, you just make a sensible choice. And I think to give weight one to the most recent observation, that's at least not, it's easy to do. And you don't have to update that, you just have to generate the sequence of weights. Now, oops. basically this function beta of t comma s, the typical thing that we've used so far is to say that it's lambda up raised to the t minus s power, as in lambda to how far back in time is this observation that I'm looking at right now. Um, where a lambda that is numerically that is less than or equal to one, and of, of greater than zero. Well, I've also added this plot before. If you go back in time, you have an exponential decay in the weights, and if you can formulate the problem such that you start with weight one for the first one, and then when you go one step backward in time. If you can then just multiply by lambda of t, it doesn't have to be fixed. It means that at any point in time, you can pick a new lambda and multiply that on the previous lambdas. If you can s formulate it like this, then you can make a recursive update. We will mostly focus on this up here, but in the case for the leaves, that are, I mean, during the summer, there's no change. And then there's a short period where there's a change. And then there's again a long period where there's no change. So therefore, it might be nice, we'll get back to that later, to have something that can actually adjust the lambda based on how good is my performance. So this is how to do the recursive update. It's basically just as before, where we just added these weights in here, because all the other weights are, you can say, incorporated in what is stored from previous time. We have weight one, and then we just forget some of the past. That's how we run the algorithm. I would encourage you to go back and look at the local linear regression model and to see where the differences are. And if you can figure out why those differences are there, it's basically an L, that is, or L inverse, that is the dif main difference for shifting the definition of H. And we can do the same thing as we did here. And eliminate H and just work directly on the theta and the R as we have it up here. So this expression here is exactly the same. The only thing is that is updated is the RT, which is essentially how much information do we have in there. When we start forgetting, you have less information. So that, and of course, if we want to do it full-blown, numerically optimal, blah, 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 we can also write it, the last expression down here, where we eliminate H and also avoid the matrix inversion of RT. Of course, the biggest difference, the biggest advantage of doing this is when RT is large. When you just have a two-dimensional system, I mean, that is also fairly stable numerically. But if you have a hundred-dimensional system, which you might have, then the inversion of a hundred by a hundred matrix. How many have done that by hand? <laughs> it's not something that you want to do. Of course, the computer can do that for you. But that's also where you can appreciate that you don't have to do that. I forgot how many operations it takes to invert a matrix. Is it the dimension to the third power? That's my guesstimate, but I don't remember. Um, so if you can avoid doing that and just have to do a, a multiplication instead, where it's, it's only a second po power, element into the element, then you're saving a lot of operations and it's much faster. 
but of course when you have a too fast computer for the time step that you have you don't have to worry so much about that <coughs> and if your numerical precision is also good enough for what you will meet I mean you don't have to take the last step but it's just a it's the numerically most attractive implementation of it. <coughs> so we can have constant forgetting factor. That's basically most like the, what we've done previously. And then I don't know if you remember how we define the memory or the total memory from that. We looked at what is the sum of the weights and it gives you one divided by one minus lambda. So when lambda gets close to one, you have uh, full memory, but as lambda is being smaller, say at say lambda is two thirds, then the memory is one minus that inverse, so that gives you the inverse of one third, which is three. So when lambda gets down very, very quickly, the memory gets down as well. That also means, well, how should you pick lambdas? Back in assignment one, you did this. And I basically asked you back then to do some trial and error, try some different values and see how it goes. And if you want to save on the number of values that you have to use, well, you can choose them so that they are spanning in steps of t rather than in equal steps of lambda. But again, it depends on how much time to have available to calculate this. If you get the equal lambda steps in a few seconds, it looks nice on a graph. But again, if you want to save time, this can help you out. I can s tell you that if you had gotten a data set that's much longer, well, time just increases linearly with the number of observations. And so I, I try to keep to give you real data, but still to give you real data that you can handle without sitting waiting too long and get frustrated because the algorithm doesn't terminate. Um, that's a balance for my end, um, but I, I'll try to reach that um, throughout all cases. Um, so, and then the question is, how do you fi find the most optimal model? then you first have to define what is optimal. What I typically look at, is it, as we also have down here, are one-step prediction errors. Because that's often what you care about. But if you want to do, say, a longer horizon prediction, that's what you have to care about. There may also be something totally different that you care about. So always, whenever you are in some situation, consider what are you actually caring about. Is it the sum of one square prediction errors as the lecturer always used as example? Maybe, maybe not. And then just as you need some observation before RT is invertible, then typically you would want to kind of leave out more than that when you want to optimize and figure out what gives you the least, the best performance. So always exclude some first observations. I was very explicit for you when uh, at the time, um, but always consider how much of the data can I just, it's not so important. It, the important thing is that it works on most of the data. And there's always a burn-in phase for these algorithms. Where life becomes more interesting and thus challenging is when you want to do variable forgetting. As I possibly before, often you can have a constant forgetting for a long time, but then there's a period where you actually want to change the forgetting factor to something different. There are many different methods. And there's one thing I didn't dig out before, but I'll find that during the break. Um, but here I'll just give you one of the simpler methods, it works. And basically, what the aim is here, if you go back a few slides, or more than just a few slides here, you have this 
some of weighted squared prediction errors. One objective could be to say, I want to find something that keeps this constant, or reasonably constant, here. So basically, you look at, you scale, scale it based on what is your current, what is the value that you want to hit. And then you use one minus this, also has one, another nice feature, this value is always less than one. But you should also apply a lower bound, because if your prediction error is all of a sudden large, oops, you got a negative lambda. So that's not good. I've tried some of the other methods, and in some of those cases, you can get a positive, you can get a lambda that's above one, if you just implement the algorithm. So you have to truncate. And for some of these algorithms, you have to kind of say what is the lower and what is the upper band that you want to live within. And then you should say, well, the, the minimum here should not be zero, because that means you start from scratch. A zero, if you go back here, a zero here means that you only have w the latest observation, everything else is forgotten. That means that RT is not invertible anymore. So you need something that is greater than zero. I would not go, say, below 0.5 or so, if you can get by with that. So, and then you can, of course, figure out for the particular application, which value should I use for S0. So that's where your tuning comes in. It's not picking the optimal lambda, but it's picking the S0 that gives you the optimal ones of predictions, or whatever you're, uh, you're estimating. So if I go back to these data and run this algorithm true, I could get something like this when I have a fixed lambda. I use a rather high lambda here. What does this correspond to? What is the total memory of this? With a lambda of 0 0.995, how good is my memory? Someone else. This is not difficult math. One divided by one minus lambda, yes. 200, so effectively you have 200 steps. And the data are hourly measurements. So you're looking at the last eight days, roughly, effectively. So you're looking at how is the model for the last week doing, and as opposed to having no forgetting, the main difference that you notice is that when you get to the next season, it starts to go down again. This is basically summertime. If you go back to the data, you can see the temperature. Oh, sorry, the temperature up here. It drops during the winter and then goes back up for the next summer. And the consumption increases during the winter. No surprise. But during the summertime, there is a different intercept. It increases during the winter time and then it decreases again during when it gets spring again. And the slope is kind of rather unstable. Something weird happens in here, but I think we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, here is just plotting the same, the data up here, and the estimates from the slide before, just combined. The slope is in green. And then I have two points up here. I've added the exponential weights. So you can see how long a tail the lambda of 0 0.995 gives you. So here at 7,000, you have to actually 1,000 steps backwards in time. You have some weight, oh, almost 1,000. That's where you get down to the zero. And you cannot, then you're within one pixel. But it means that you're actually using a lot of information from the previous, just two examples here. 
to illustrate what's actually going on. Now, I think this is the proper time to, to make a break, so let's resume around five minutes to nine, and then I will start by showing a more, an even more complex scheme than this one here. This is fairly easy, um, but as I will show you in a moment, it doesn't uh, always perform nice. But let's take that after the break.